first reading is from Numbers, chapter 16, verses 41 through 50. So if you turn there or bring it up on your tablet or whatever you have. In this account, the Israelites falsely accused Moses and Aaron of killing many Israelites. And in fact, it was God's judgment who swallowed up the men and their families. But here we also see a priest stopping death, the priest being Aaron, stopping death by atoning for sins. This is a picture of what Jesus has done for us. The next day, the entire Israelite community complained about Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the Lord's people. When the community assembled against them, Moses and Aaron turned toward the tent of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the Lord's glory appeared. Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord said to Moses, Get away from this community so, <laughs> so that I may consume them instantly. But they fell face down. Then Aaron, then Moses told Aaron, Take your fire pan, place fire from the altar, in it, and add incense. Go quickly to the community and make atonement for them, because wrath has come from the Lord, and the plague has begun. So Aaron took his fire pan, as Moses, as Moses had ordered, ran into the middle of the assembly, and saw that the plague had begun among the people. After he added incense, he made atonement for the people. He stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was halted. But those who died from the plague numbered 14,700, in addition to those who died because of the Korah incident. Aaron then returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, since a plague had been halted.
Last night as I was uh, getting ready for the service together today, um, I, was, I was writing out the check for, for the church. And, and as I did that, uh, and uh, I went to get the envelope to put it in, and I noticed, wait a second, that's the wrong envelope. And then I remembered, oh yeah, we didn't do, do, we didn't do church last week. And uh, so just to make it a little more work for the people who do the counting, I wrote a second check uh, for the other one. And then this morning, Michael uh, Pierce said to me, he says, he says, I got them both. He says, I remember last week. And I thought, how easily we can forget. You know, we sing, you know, we sing, you know, in all I do, I honor you. But how easily we can forget sometimes. And we can forget a God and, and how we honor him. I hope that your, your offering is uh, given as an honor to God, that you give it because you honor him. Uh, that should be certainly the motivation behind uh, what we do. Our thanks and you know, recognizing who he is, that we have the privilege, honor of being his and part of his kingdom. As the ushers come forward to receive your gifts and offerings, let's pray. Father, thank you that we can have this relationship with you. Thank you that you have given us well, so much more than we deserve. Um, we are grateful. We are grateful for your provision for us in Christ. We're grateful for your provision each and every day. Don't let us lose track of that. Don't let us. Uh, don't, let, don't let it get covered up and, and muddled by other things. But to be able to keep our focus on you, we need that. Uh, this offering is it's just an expression of that, an expression of our desire that our attention and focus be on you, that we honor you in all we do, in what we give, as well as in how we use what we keep, that all we do will honor you, we pray in Christ's name.
right-hand side of the road as I was driving. And it reminded me of the promise of God, you know, that he would never again destroy the earth. Why? Because of his love, because of his grace, because of his mercy. And today we celebrate communion, which is a celebration of what God has done so that he no longer needs to judge the earth in the way it was judged through the flood. That Christ gave his life. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We just sang, and in eternity I'll sing on, I'll sing on, and we will. We will because of what Christ has done. That rainbow to me this morning was just a reminder of the promise of God and the grace of God and the gift of God that is ours in Jesus Christ. Not something that we deserve. That's, you see, that's the whole purpose of a gift. A gift is giving us something we don't deserve. A gift is giving, is giving to some, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he loved the world so much that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. The elements, you know, and again, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little different for us, you know, because we, we are, are using these um, combined things. Um, again, not my favorite way to do communion, but that's my hang-up, you see. The thing is, whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you remember him. You remember that you're forgiven. You remember, you know, the grace of God that, that is there for us, you know, to, to forgive us of our sin. You know, just as that rainbow reminded me this morning, this is to remind me again that his body was broken, his blood was shed. The deacons are going to help me um, pass the communion this morning, so if you gentlemen will come up and join me up front here. Um, and again, they're going to pass these. The one side has the, has the uh, bread in there. And uh, you, you just take that uh, by yourself as a reminder, your reminder of what Christ has done in giving his life on the cross for you. And then uh, we'll take the Flip it over and we'll take the other side together uh, to remind us of his shed blood for our sin. And after, after they pass these, uh, you know, and we take, well, during the benevolent offering, they'll come along and collect the stuff from you, <laughs> you know, uh, to do that. But let's pray together. Father, thank you for that sacrifice of Christ. Thank you for what is ours in Christ. I pray that you will make this a, a great time of remembrance, a time of honoring you, a time of thanking you for that shed blood, for that broken body, that we can be forgiven. Thank you for the forgiveness that is ours through his sacrifice, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. They're not going to pass the plates. You know, if you'd like one or you want your kids to have one, let them know, and uh, they will individually hand those, uh, hand those to you.
in recognition that we know him, not just, not just in our head, but in our heart, and that our faith is in his, shed, in his broken body and shed blood for us. Let's take this together. We take a benevolent offering after communion. Sometimes they're designated to go outside of the church. Sometimes we use them inside the church. This is the one that this offering will be used through the church. 100% of what you give will go toward uh, the benevolent offering. And um, as they are collecting that, the deacons will also, will also be coming along to uh, take your, your cups and things from you. As the ushers come forward, once again, let's pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity to bind together in Christ and to bind together in our finances to be able to help those who, uh, who need that financial help. We ask that you would give us wisdom as we use it, that it would be an investment into the kingdom, not simply throwing money at an issue or a problem, uh, but showing the love of Christ in whose name we give and in whose name we pray. I like those songs that he had. Pastor Kent picked out for these. We're going to go ahead and dismiss the children for Children's Church at this time to go downstairs with the, those who are, are leading them, who are leading them in their studious uh, endeavors downstairs. Apparently somebody brought their dog. <laughs> you know, to hear their joyful noise when they leave is uh, such an encouragement to me um, to know that they're excited about this. I remember back in the olden days when we used to have Sunday school um, and to see in the, in, the, in the morning to be out there and you can still see it some, not quite as much, but um, the kids get out of the car and they beat the parents in and the kids come running around the corner to come into church you know and the parents are dawdling along behind and I just think what a great gift uh, their excitement and being able to be together well several years ago uh, Jenny and I were selling a car and nobody we knew needed a car at that time not one that was stick shift anyway which is what this one was so we knew we would be selling it to somebody um, we didn't know. We knew we would be selling it to a stranger. Now, I didn't want to take a check from somebody I didn't know. It just didn't seem prudent to me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I can tend to lean that way sometimes. And so um, I went to the office supply store, and I got one of those uh, marking pens uh, to make sure that I wasn't accepting any counterfeit bills. Now, one of those, those marking pens, uh, they react with, with uh, the wood pulp in in paper uh, and it leaves a black mark now the money money is printed on uh, not a wood based paper but a fiber based paper and so it doesn't when you put the mark on there it doesn't 
it doesn't change color. It you know it it stays um, you know whatever the mark is when when you first do it. Um, now the guy buying the car hands me you know a, a pile of hundred dollar bills. I wish it were a bigger pile, but at any rate, he handed me this pile of hundred dollar bills. And not being too familiar with hundred dollar bills, they don't come through my hands very often. I you know I, I used this marking pen and I sat there and I I marked each single one. Um, you know, to make sure it was real. And even if I did handle $100 bills a lot, I mean, what's the purpose of a counterfeit? The purpose of a counterfeit is to look as much like the real thing as possible. You know, so how would I ever, you know, I mean, really, if it was good counterfeit, how would I even know? So I needed the help of a marking pen. Well, I was thinking about this, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a marking pen to test the authenticity of everything? Then I could be an expert on Antiques Roadshow. Oh, you say this is a Tiffany lamp. Let me get out my Tiffany lamp pen and just see if, if, if that's correct, you know. Or, oh, you, your grandpa says that, that, that this belonged to George Washington. Well, let me get out my George Washington pen and make sure, you know, and see if that's what it is. Or just think if we could get a set of liar pens. You know, and your kid says, yeah, they finished all their homework, and all you do is take out that pen, put a mark across their forehead, and you'll know right away if they did or not. Or your wife says to you, I only spent $20 on those shoes. Swab her cheek. You know, just give a little mark at it. Uh, and, or your husband comes in and says, you know, I, well, I, I, wasn't, I didn't stay and watch the game. You know, I, I wasn't. That's not why I was late. It was traffic, and you could just, put a, you know, swipe across his nose and see if, he, you know, if he's telling the truth or not. You know, what a, handy, what a handy thing it would be to be able to, you know, to be able to tell counterfeits like that. Well, we, we're into the section in 1 John that addresses how we can tell real Christians from counterfeit Christians. How we can tell those with a real relationship with Christ to those uh, and those with a counterfeit relationship with Christ. You know, whether they're, uh, you know, whether they're simply looking the part and are counterfeit or whether they're real. Let's pray and we're going to get into the passage. Father, thank you for your word and your truth to us. And we know we can trust you. Now, as we, as we look at this, it's really a two-pronged thing, not, not just in looking at others, but looking at ourselves as well. Boy, we don't ever want to be a counterfeit. We don't ever want to be counterfeit in what we do for you. So teach us from your word and show us from your heart. Speak to our heart. You know, again, the needs of everyone here. And, and um, I, I don't. I couldn't. And you know what they need to hear. You know what your, from your word will touch them. So I pray that you will use that and continue just in the way you have in the past and you will in the future, that even right now in the present, you will touch our hearts from your word and your truth, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be in First John chapter 3. Turn there, if you will, 7 through 10. For con I'm going to start reading with verse 1, actually, for context. Um, you know, we covered these verses two weeks ago. So I'm simply going to point out a few things in, in the, um, the first six verses, and then we're going to move on to verses 7 through 10. So 1 John chapter 3, uh, follow along again. We're going to start with verse 1 there. It says, Look at how great a love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. That's a great thing for you to either circle in your Bible or highlight, you know, in, in your, on your phone or however it is you're doing it. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, what I want you to grasp right there is, is the fact and the reality that when you have a relationship with Christ, you are God's child right now. It's not something that you're going to be later. It's something that you are right now. That when you, when you have that relationship with Christ, you, have, you are his child right now. Now, when he appears, when Christ appears, you know, that, that, uh, what, that, will be, uh, that relationship for us will be of a higher degree of, of living. It will be a more intense, it will be a face-to-face -face, uh, 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 relationship. But he tells us very clearly that this is what we are right now. We are as, we are as much, grasp this, 
we are as much a child of God right now as we will be when we are in his presence face to face. When we leave this, when we leave this earth and, and we go to be with Christ, we are just as much a child of God right now as we will be then. Again, then there, the, there will be a, a higher degree of intensity as we see him face to face, but the reality of that relationship is, is just as full, just as real right now as it will be when we stand before him face to face. So we need to grasp a hold of that. You know, we're God's children because of what Christ did on the cross, not because of anything we have done but because of what Christ has done on the cross. We just celebrated, we just, you know, uh, celebrated communion together, remembering his broken body, his, his shed blood, and it's because of what he has done on the cross, not because of anything we have done. And just as Christ, you know, set himself, he set, you know, he set himself apart in obedience to God, and that, now pay attention to what we're saying here, that qualified him to achieve the purpose for which he came to be the sacrifice for our sin. The sacrifice for our sin was a sinless sacrifice. And his obedience to God as he walked on this earth and he remained sinless, then you see, he, so he came and went to the cross as a sinless sacrifice. He was qualified. Why? Because he lived a sinless life here on earth also. And so, you know, and, and, and that's, the, that's the, the comparison for us here. You know, those with a relationship with God as a child of God were to set ourselves apart in obedience to God's will. And again, we covered this more two weeks ago. You can, you can listen to it online. Let's pick up verse 4. It says, everyone who commits sin also breaks the law. Uh, sin is breaking of law. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Now, two weeks ago, we didn't get into this as much as I would like to, you know, and, and just real briefly, though. Notice what it says here. Sin is breaking of law. Some translations say sin is lawlessness. Some say, you know, practices lawlessness. Uh, what, what, you, what you need to grasp with this is that, that, that what that means is not merely uh, to break the law, but it's to despise, it, the, the word means to despise the, you know, the, the very idea that there is a law to which one must submit. That's what that word lawless means. That's what it conveys. That there, is, that there is a resentment, you know, that there is actually a law that, that we have to submit to. It it's, speaks of having utter contempt for the law. You know, it, and that originates from an attitude that resents God's moral demands on our lives. That's where the attitude comes from. And that's what he's talking about when he's talking about law, lawless. You know, that, it's a, that attitude that resents God's moral demands on, on our lives. As I was reading through this again this morning, I was reminded of myself. I've told you before, there's some traffic laws I don't like. I think, you know, when I drive down Washington Center, and I'm heading from Lima Road west on Washington Center. And it's not too far down. You get to a part where, uh, I think, it, is it Hills Meat Market? Is that the one that's on Washington Center? Hills Meat Market is there, good food. See, you can tell who goes there. Uh, so Hills Meat Market is there. And what they did is they put in a turning lane. But what they did for the turning lane is they just took the lane that was there and they made that a turning lane, and then if you want to go straight, then you have to move over and go around a little bit. Now, there's no road over here. There's no road at all on your right. When I get there, and there's nobody turning, I don't like to have to move over to that little part and, and go around and come back. It's stupid. It's stupid. I'm going to just go straight. Okay, so that's just an example for you. And as I was reading through this this morning, and, and I was reading and I thought, to have utter contempt for the law. You 
God tells me I need to obey our governmental authorities when it doesn't go against his word and, and in driving it doesn't go against his word. And I thought, Lord, um, I don't resent your moral demands on my life or do I sometimes when I'm driving? Just a thought for you there. I'm just telling you how God was speaking to me this morning. You see, uh, that sinner's inward attitude of rebellion against God is the essence of sin. That's the essence of sin. You know, the, the very foundation of a relationship with God is a recognition and an acknowledgement that he is the one who defines the standard of right and wrong. It is not open for negotiation. It is not debatable. It is recognizing that God is the one who sets that standard and we willingly submit ourselves to his authority in all things. That's the essence of repentance, you see. The essence of repentance is realizing that God is the one who is in control and what he says is, is. And we don't get to set the standard. But what we do is we repent. We turn from our own way and turn to God's way because of our commitment to and submission to him. That's the essence of, of repentance and what he calls us to here when he's talking about, you know, this the sin is, is lawlessness. What we say when we, commit to, when we commit to Christ and we come to him as a, as a child of his is that we willingly submit ourselves to his authority in all things. You know, the, the, remaining in Christ means, means refraining from a lifestyle of sin. That we refrain from that. There is absolutely no way to justify sin as, uh, as something that is compatible with a relationship with Christ. There is no way you can do that. There is no way that you can justify sin, which is a going against what God says, rebelling against God's authority. There is no way that you can justify going against God's authority as something that is compatible with a relationship with Christ. They're incompatible. And th this is what he's telling us here. They're incompatible. Philippians chapter 3, he says, For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. They do what? They live as enemies of the cross of, cross of Christ. Their living shows that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. What they take glory and what they take pride in is really to their shame because it's showing that they don't have a relationship with Christ. It's showing that they rebel against Christ. It's showing that they want to be independent of him. It says they are focused on what? Earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. If we have a relationship with Christ, if we are God's child, our citizenship is, a, is in heaven. And it says, for, from which we also eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our living shows that we are an enemy of the cross, counterfeit, or that we are a child of God, real. It shows that we are real or we are counterfeit, redeemed by Christ and now part of his family, right now, here and now, a child of God. Let's move on. Verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's work. What you see here is a back and forth about God's children, those with a real relationship with God. It says, and the children of the devil, those with a counterfeit relationship with God. And it goes back and forth here. Now remember, he is, remember he is talking to people in the church. And he is talking to, and he is talking to people, you know, particularly here, to those who are, to those and about those who are leading people astray. He says, let no one deceive you. Don't be led astray from God. Don't be, you know, don't, don't accept ideas. Don't accept theories. Don't accept standards that are contrary to God's word. Don't accept things that are, that are, uh, go against his character. 
don't accept things that mock his being. These were all things that were going on in, in their church. Those are all things that we get challenged with today. Don't get talked into rationalizations that avoid or subvert the truth which is found in God. Don't get talked into rationalizations that, that subvert God, that sink what God says. Don't get talked into rationalizations that avoid the truth of God, but avoid the truth in our living. Rationalizations are simply you know, a distorting of the truth of God to excuse our own behavior or our own preferences. That's all rationalizations are. We want, to excuse our own, we want to excuse our own behavior. We want to excuse our own preferences. We want to make room for the way we want to do things, and so we begin to rationalize. Did God really say? Have you ever heard of that before? The same thing the serpent said to Eve back in the garden. Did God really say? And we begin to ask, and we begin to question ourselves, did God really say? Because if we can talk ourselves out of it, if we can convince ourselves that God didn't say it, and we don't really convince ourselves sometimes, what we do is we choose to ignore what God really said. We haven't convinced ourselves, we choose to ignore. Now one of the problems for us is, as we continue to choose to ignore, and we continue to choose to ignore, and continue to choose to ignore, oh, Scripture tells us we become callous, thick-skinned. And, and the word of God isn't getting, isn't getting through anymore. Why? Because we have rebuffed him so often. We have turned him away so often. We have put up that outer shell so that he can't get through, so that we don't have to feel guilty. Well, you, don't ha you know what? You don't ever have to feel guilty if you obey God. Just a thought for you there. You know, it's it, just a thought. You, obey, you, you don't have to feel guilty if you obey God. It's a form of lawlessness, resenting and rebelling against God's authority in your living when you're making rationalizations, when you're making excuses. Now, I will tell you, this goes for you know, scientific proclamations as well, and standards of behavior, you know, and theories about justice, just to name a few areas. The art of deception is to look real. The art of deception is to look authentic. John here is warning them because they had people teaching false ideas. They had people teaching an enlightened way. An enlightened way. You know, some under the guise of religion and enlightenment, some under the banner of knowledge. You know, they had, you know, the Greeks, and they, they, the knowledge was a big deal and a big thing, and it's the same, the same thing we have today. Some were blending of the two. Now, we have many teachings that are contrary to the word of God under the facade of religion and unders, under others under the facade of knowledge or under the facade of science. Now, pay attention because I am not saying we reject science. That would be foolish. We learn a lot from science. Do you, have you ever taken any medicine? Medicine comes as a result of science. But what they have done there, you know, they, they, they've done experiments, they've done they have begun, you know, and they have seen the way that of what those things that God has made, how they react to the body and what they do. You know, don't, don't give science, you know, don't give science and so-called knowledge more credence than they deserve because they didn't create anything. They discovered what God had already created. You see, and they discovered how these I would say chemicals, in some cases it is, how these things that God had already created and how the body reacts and responds to those. And through scientific experiments and scientific, you know, uh, uh, unfolding, you ever taken an antibiotic? An antibiotic comes because they did what? They did science and they saw how this, how this uh, element, stuff that God had created, affects the, you know, the, the particular bacteria that you are infected with. And so you take some of that particular thing that, that goes against the bacteria that you are infected with, you see. So I, what I'm saying here, you know, I'm not saying that we reject science, but you know, science, knowledge, and Christianity all look at the same evidence and come to different conclusions. You know, and realize 
all, <clears throat> all of the positions depend on faith to get to their conclusion. Even science. Even though they would deny it, they don't. You know, some look at the things of nature and a scientist says, isn't nature wonderful? Looking at the same evidence there of nature, the Christian looks and says, isn't God wonderful? You see, the, don't be deceived. Both statements are a statement of faith. Both statements are a statement of faith. Now, science doesn't like to, you know, those who, who tout the banner of science don't like to admit that. But there's, there's things they cannot prove, they cannot duplicate. What they have done is looked at the same evidence we have, and they have come to the conclusion, well, then this must have happened. Well, to me, they're forgetting, you know, they, it, it, just realize they're both a position of faith. You know, understand that. You know, understand it. Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. He goes, he says, the one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does habitually, this is what he's talking about, the one who habitually, naturally, consistently does what is right in God's eyes. In God's eyes. Because the living flows from the being. Your living flows from your being, from who you are. It's easy to put on a facade sometimes. Okay, sometimes it's not. It's hard to put on a facade sometimes. But you see, there's the problem. If you're putting it on, then, and then, then it becomes more and more work. You know, who you are, you've heard it before. You know, who you are when no one's looking is who you are. You know, that, that's, that's what matters. That's there's part of the real you. And then, you know, the, the, the one who lives in and from a relationship with God and obedience to God is showing that their life has been transformed by their relationship with Christ Jesus. The one who does what is right, their life has been transformed. The one who does what is right is righteous. What's, what are they saying? That his doing of right produced righteousness? No. What they're saying is his doing of right shows it's flowing from the fact that he is righteous just as he is righteous. You know, everyone who lives out their relationship with God shows that their faith is real. Contrasted to that is those who don't have a relationship with God and how they live out. They choose to do their own thing. They choose to please others. They choose the values of society. They are living out their lack of a relationship with Christ. You are either living out your relationship with Christ or you're living out your lack of a relationship with Christ. Even though they may claim to have a relationship with Christ, what they're showing is that they're counterfeit. Again, the standard is Jesus Christ. Notice what it says. It says it, it is just as he is righteous. There's the standard. The standard is Christ Jesus. It's not something else. It's, it's, it's not, you know, the values of society. It's not what somebody else is doing. It's Christ Jesus. And the one who lives by a, by a, a natural flow from sin in their life, or those who, you know, consistently choose sin as their course of action, it says, is of the devil, not God. They're counterfeit. Their connection is with the devil, not with God. John is very consistent in his viewpoint throughout his letter. In chapter 2, uh, he said, the one, who says, the one who says, I have come to know him, yet does not keep his, his commands, is a liar, is a counterfeit, and the truth is not in him. A little bit later in chapter 2, uh, who is the liar, who is the counterfeit, if, the, if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah, is also the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. A little bit later, we're going to get to chapter 4, uh, verse 20. It says, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. He is a counterfeit for the person who does not love his brother he has seen, cannot love God he has not seen. Real versus counterfeit. You know, the, Jesus Christ versus the devil. This is what he's talking about. Verse, look at it again. Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. On the other side, the one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. John was contrasting the two here so that we can better know what is real and better reject what is counterfeit. Sinning, you know, sinning, lying, it, that's the devil's character. It's his, it's his natural state. In his gospel, John wrote, you are of your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar. He is a counterfeit and he is the father of liars. He is the, he is the father of counterfeits. There's only two choices here. There is no middle ground. You're either for God or against God. You know, they're, they're, Christ Jesus, you know, he stands in direct opposition to the devil here. Jesus stands in truth. What we do reveals whose we are. You know, it, regardless of who we say we are, or regardless of who we say we belong to, what we do reveals that. Who's your daddy? Christ Jesus or the devil? You know, who, who, who is it? Are you real or counterfeit? Jesus came to give his life on the cross for your sin, to make you a child of God, to transform your life, to give you a real relationship, not counterfeit lip service. Pick up with me, verse 9 and 10. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children are made evident. You see, those who, are, those who have been born of God have been given new life and therefore don't continue to sin, don't continue living in sin. That would be counterfeit living. Those who are born of God. Real living, you know, is in and from their new life in Christ, which is not marked by sin. Their life has been transformed and they're living from their transformed new life. The necessity, the necessity of being born again shows the depth of the destruction of sin. The depth of the destruction of sin is so, so bad and so pervasive that there is a new life that needs to be given. There is a new life that needs to come. This is what he's talking about here. This is what he's talking about when he's talking about, you know, the, the being born of God. Nothing less than new life can restore what was lost in sin and restore that relationship with God. You know, th this, is, this is part of what Paul meant when he wrote to the Galatians and he said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. A real, a real life, a transformed life, a new life. This is what he's talking about. It's not just a remaking of the old. It's a killing of the old and a, re and a bringing to life of a new life here. So when he says here in verse 9 that they're not able to sin, it means as a chosen lifestyle. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. What it means is as a chosen lifestyle, you do not choose to continue to live in sin. Are we tempted? Yes. Do we sometimes give in to temptation? Yes. Back to chapter 1. That, that if you sin, you know, you confess your sin to him, he is faithful, he is just, he will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's not saying we never sin. What he's saying is we, we, we don't choose to live, to continue to live in sin. We don't continue to choose to continue to live in a way that is totally contrary to God. You know, the, the incompatible nature between God's children, those with a real relationship with God here, and the children of the devil, those who reject God, that incompatibility, you know, leads God's children to reject sin as a lifestyle. It, 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 moves, it brings God's children, to, you know, to reject counterfeit living. And, and to embrace living for and with God as the driving force, to embrace real living, because they are given a new life, a new nature in Christ. Everyone who is born of God cannot go on, cannot choose and continue to be a deliberate sinner. They cannot choose to be a deliberate sinner. Nothing less than new life can remedy this broken relationship with God and destroy the works of the devil that has a hold on us. How one lives out 
their life reveals their nature. And if they have a transforming relationship with God, real, or whether they continue to reject God and embrace a lifestyle opposing God, counterfeit. Real or counterfeit. How we live our life shows that. And verse 10 really kind of begins almost, uh, well, another further revelation of that. How we live our life toward others show who we follow. If we follow God or the devil, we're going to pick up more with that next week. But real or counterfeit, make your stand. Realize where you stand. Stand with God. Stand with Christ. That new, live from that new transformed life that comes from a relationship with Christ. Let's pray together. Father, what you have given us is, again, not what we deserve. We deserve, we deserve death for the sin we have committed. And you've given us what we don't deserve, forgiveness and new life in Christ. We need your help to live that out more. We still struggle. We still struggle with temptation. We struggle with our own desires. We struggle with what uh, the values of the world that are constantly thrown up in our face. And Lord, to try to excuse that because of uh, some, what we might see sometimes as the overwhelming way in which that comes at us, that you are so much stronger than the world. You are so much stronger than any sin that comes against us. Oh, don't let us be so foolish as to try to rely on our own strength, to try to think we got this and we can handle this. We can't. It's our relationship with you that makes the difference. Help us to live in it. Help us to live from it. That as we go from here today and each day, that we will, we will tomorrow morning again just wake up and remind ourselves that we are a child of God and that we will live as a child of God today. Help us to live that real life of a connection with you. Not to give up and not to give in to the temptations that are thrown at us by the enemy and even from our own desires but to live and follow you and see how you be victorious in our life, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand together for the benediction, please? And as we close today, uh, if you need prayer for something, we are still working on getting these schedules um, together for, for prayer up here. Um, uh, Jackie, would you be able to? Jackie will be up here. She's one of our deaconesses. And a fine lady, too. But um, if you need prayer for anything as we dismiss, Jackie will be up here to pray with you and for you. There will be others and uh, that will watch. And uh, If you need prayer for something that we talked about today, or maybe you, know, you just got some challenges, real challenges coming up this week, you want someone to pray with you and pray for you, as we dismiss you, come on up. Jackie will be here, and she'll pray for you as well. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, and has set us before his presence without fault and with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and dominion, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said.